This week I'm joined by Ken Hirschkop, who is a professor of English language and literature at the University of Waterloo. In this episode, we discuss the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, alongside discussions on David Donaldson, language, empathy, communication, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you would like to support Omitix, gain access to some exclusive content, or just keep the podcast running, then please find links in the description below for our patron. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Ken Hirschkop, thanks very much for joining us on Omitix Podcast. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, we are going to be discussing the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, who, as I understand it, is a writer that you have spent a long time uh, writing about, and primarily we'll be taking uh, uh, the questions and the, my own research and the influence for this discussion from uh, the, the Cambridge introduction to, to Mik- Mikhail Bakhtin, which was published last year by Cambridge University Press, and is a, is a fantastic introduction to uh, a writer who's I imagine, maybe you can correct me on this, probably quite difficult to get to grips with in a overall sort of whole sense, considering uh, he spans, you know, quite a lot of various uh, genres of thought or, or ideas, you know, literary criticism, philosophy, philosophy of language, etc. And his work, as we'll get to, is is sort of very fragmented over, over history and uh, appears in a strange form so we say but before we we jump in with Bakhtin um just tell us a little bit about yourself uh your work and as you mentioned in the uh the start of the book this may be your last book on Bakhtin so uh your your journey if you will my journey um okay uh well I'm uh, I'm American uh I was born in uh, Brooklyn and raised in Boston and I went to university first my first degree was uh, at a college in the United States, and then I did my graduate work in England at London and Oxford. Uh, and I wrote my PhD on Bakhtin. Uh, it was actually pretty much serendipitous. I'd, uh, I'd done Russian in school and in university, uh, kind of on the side, not as a major. And I was becoming interested in various elements, literary theory. And so I kind of needed a topic and it just, I kind of fell into it to be perfectly honest. Uh, But it has sort of dominated my academic life since uh, because after my dissertation was finished, I then turned that into a book eventually. And one thing led to another and I just ended up doing Bakhtin stuff for most of my career. Uh, And I was, when I did this book, I thought, okay, you know, I've been doing this now for really too long. Uh, And hopefully I can just take what I figured out and uh, sum it up and kind of put an end to it, if you see what I mean. Uh, So uh, that's why I say, I, I hope it's my final publication on Bakhtin. Ah, I see, I see. So at the time when you were, uh, were about to write your or entering into your PhD. Were there any other key thinkers that you thought could have been a possibility? Well, I'd I'd actually come to England thinking I was going to work with Raymond Williams, who was sort of my who had sort of inspired me to shift fields. In fact, I was a music major, so I, I kind of I'd moved I don't know laterally, I suppose. Uh, but I couldn't really write about him. Uh, so there were other people I was interested in, you know, kind of the usual suspects, Frankfurt school people like Adorno and Benjamin, that sort, I suppose, you know, maybe if I'd known German, I would have written about them instead of Bakhtin. I see. I see. So it was your sort of your interest in Russian literature, which led you, led you here. I mean, how come you took such a leap from music to, to this? It's quite, it seems quite a big step uh, um music at the time i did my degree which was in the 70s uh music was a very uh I, and i was a kind of theory and composition student and history student uh and it was fairly narrow field i mean i was trained in a very uh highly formal and technical mode of analysis uh that was suitable for a fairly narrow range of the world's musical production. And there wasn't, at that time, there wasn't really a lot else going on, to be honest. 
Uh, now there is, it's changed quite dramatically, uh, but I was, I guess I was impatient. Uh, and so uh, I, the literary, what was going on in literature seemed to be a lot more um, broad and interesting. And the literature people seemed to be uh, interested in cognizant of what was going on in other fields in a way that music people just weren't at that point in time. Okay. So that that's really what did it. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe all of these the, the these these sort of influences will come in. But before we jump in with Bakhtin, uh, I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? And uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, as we're talking about him, is already in there waiting. Okay. So Bakhtin is one. Uh, Walter Benjamin is the second one. Mm-hmm. I think because he's he's quite different writer, but he's sort of a kindred spirit. At the same time, I think he was born three years earlier. Um, they have very similar experiences, of course. They both I'm, well. Benjamin did not experience most of the Second World War, but um, uh, they both are people who are sort of have a lot of interest in religious material, although they're not strictly speaking theologians or theological thinkers um you know but they're on this kind of borderline so i think they'd be good together uh number three is donald davidson the philosopher donald davidson i think Uh, i vaguely know the name he's an analytic philosopher who's done a lot of very interesting stuff on philosophy of language uh very different from bakhtin that's the point i suppose uh but it's one of those It's one of those situations where people are talking about, if they had a chat, they would realize that they're talking about the same thing, although they think about it and they use a completely different terminology to describe it. So I think Davidson would be, brings all sorts of things that um, in the philosophy of language that that are interesting to the table uh, that overlap with Bakhtin and Benjamin, but he just comes at it from a completely different, but very interesting perspective. Mm. What 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 is it that they're talking about that they're all talking about but don't realize it? I think they're talking about the way in which um, languages function and the inadequacy of let's let's call it the code model of language to account for the way that language functions. Mm-hmm. Um, Davidson is famous for having said in a very late essay that there is no such thing as a language. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to have to ask you to open up on that. What does he okay. what, does, what does he mean by that? Um, and then he says, "Not if by language we mean what philosophers and linguists say." He means that when you master, when you're able to communicate, it's not because you've mastered a set of conventions that you share with other people. Mm-hmm. What is it that you've mastered? Um, well, it isn't that you've really mastered one particular set of things. You you have a lot of experience talking, communicating with other people. And on that basis, you can attribute meaning to their utterances, to what they've been saying. But you don't do it on the basis. I mean, you practically you lean on conventions a lot, mm-hmm. but you don't really. The conventions are the result of communications, he says, mm-hmm. not the origin of them. Uh, often, he says, you know, when you you figure out what somebody means by what they say it has to do with it has to do with the words they're uttering but it also has to do with who they are what the situation is your experience with similar situations in the past um what you think they might be trying to do with the words in this particular context which might mean that they're speaking ironically or metaphorically or Mm. sarcastically or whatever um, and as he said, just, you know, rules of thumb, guesswork, all sorts of other things. You know, <laughs> that sounds like a very risky analytic philosopher, treading <laughs> treading quite precariously next to figures such as, you know, Derrida, et cetera. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's considered quite mainstream in the funny sort of way. Wow. Um, uh, but he is very, yeah, he is kind of very uh, provocative in his way. Mm, okay, so I, I think that'd be it. yeah, that would be an extremely interesting room then to to try um you know discern I guess really what what communication is in a sense and how and how it's even happening. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I'm sure these these figures will come in again. Um, but you you already mentioned sort of the World War in relation to Benjamin and Bakhtin, and of course you know to sort of if we were to situate 
Bhakti philosophically and historically, where can we sort of, uh, yeah, situate him? But of course, this is difficult because this sort of ties in with the next question, which is Bhakti work is, he has a long, it's, it's quite a long history of work and it's spread out quite strangely in a way. Uh, well, I've got one more guest, don't I? Uh, my apologies. My apologies. <laughs> no, it's okay. okay. Well, yeah. Sorry, I, I was treading while. ahead. No, that's okay. It's I, I struggled for a while with this one. The, the fourth one is going to be Tilly Olson. I don't know Tilly Olson at all. Tilly Olson okay. is uh, an American writer. Uh, she was a uh, working class communist writer. Her life spans most of the twentieth century. Um, she's known for various short stories and fiction writings, but also she wrote a book called Silences, which is really about the challenges that um, working class and female writers had in particular. And I think she would just be a great, well, to be honest, one thing, I, it couldn't just be all blokes. I thought that mm. would be appalling. Um, but also she'd be a great uh, contrast to the other three and to well, she's a communist. Bakhtin lived under a communist regime, which he more or less loathed, or certainly it was very unkind to him, let's put it like that. Um, and uh, But she represents a different side of that whole tradition. Uh, she wasn't a bureaucrat or a, a party official or anything like that. Um, and she, of course, has an interest in writing communication, but as from a writerly point of view, uh, but she's also aware of all sorts of constraints, which I think the other people would be aware of, well, Benjamin certainly, but they don't always figure explicitly in their theory. So I think she'd be a good counterpoint. Mm. To, uh, I think um, I think as you say, a woman is a woman is needed. Otherwise, it's going to be quite a charged charged atmosphere, possibly a bit too exhausting. Well, I'm sure she will. She was no shrinking violet, mm -hmm. so um, I'm sure she will uh, hold her own. Uh, but I also just think, you know, I, I don't want to set up a conversation with four chaps talking about great things. I, I think that I think that time is hopefully past. Mm -hmm. so. What do you think she'd she'd bring to that conversation regarding communication? Was that a big a big problem of her own as well? I'm not I'm not familiar with her work. Well, I mean, she's a as a writer, mm -hmm. of course, it's central to her. Um, but I think she's aware of the particular problems that you know the, of the unevenness of communication, the fact that not everybody has equal access to all its resources, and you know it takes to craft certain kinds of writing. It takes time. It takes certain amount of financial security. It takes a lot of things. I mean, Bakhtin also was, I mean, it'd be interesting also because they could trade stories about the difficulty of writing. Mm. But Bakhtin had problems writing because he was constantly on the lam, effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and because, you know, he suffered for the Second World War, the purges, all sorts of stuff like that. Hers were more directly uh, class-related. So I think they'd have a lot to talk about there too. So I think there's a question about how the context and conditions of writing affect writing, and they could have a, a very interesting chat about that. Mm. As I understand it as well, ben Benjamin had, uh, 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 I might get this wrong, was he either st struggling to write or did he have quite a bit of privilege behind him, which allowed him to consistently no. write? Uh, well, he had. He came from a very well-off uh, uh Berlin middle class family, uh, so he's comfortable. Um, but he then, uh, once the Nazis took over, he then had a lot of trouble getting work. Um, you know, a lot of avenues were closed off to him. He eventually ended up escaping to Paris. So you know, his life was not uh, easy. Mm. That. And I guess put in, you know, put into contrast with someone such as Davidson, who's just living your average, I imagine your average American, you know. Everything's yeah. sort of supplied yeah. for you. There's no, the, I guess the question of what happens to writing, communication and creative work under pressures as opposed to, I can, you know, just comfortable. Yeah, yeah, comfortable yeah no, life. Davidson would have been the one who was relatively unpressured, so far as I know, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Do, you, do you, I mean, I guess that's a question for those three and, and you could bring Davidson in. Do you think that uh, the, do you think without the pressures, their writing may, may not have existed at all. 
Uh, I'm sure, well, they would have written, whether they would have written anything as interesting is, uh, I, I have to say, sort of doubt. I mean, I don't want it to, it's a kind of romantic Russian thing about, you know, how if you haven't suffered, you can't write, stuff like that. And I don't quite want to go down that road. But I think uh, in the case of Benjamin and um, Bakhtin, their historical experience has fed fairly directly into this, the, their ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the same, obviously, with Olson. So I, I think um, without those pressures and without the historical conditions they had, they would have, they would have not had to face front and center certain things that they did have to face, which fed directly into their theory, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So really, we need to spend a few years in Siberia before we'll, we'll ever... Well, Hap, well, Hap Bakhtin didn't fortunately manage to avoid that fate, but it, yeah, it did. I mean, there's other ways in which it affected him, which maybe we'll get into in a few minutes, but mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, apologies for rushing your rushing your room there. Um, no, no. But no, no. to begin this sort of historic situation, really, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Where where can we place Bakhtin historically and then philosophically? I mean, is he in dialogue? This didn't particularly come through in the text. I mean, other than than Dostoevsky early on, he doesn't seem to be in direct dialogue with. And I don't want to do the whole famous philosophers versus forgotten philosophers thing, but he doesn't seem to be in direct dialogue with people now who've been specifically canonized or is this something maybe i've missed are you thinking of anybody in particular no <laughs> no but of- no one came up who he seemed to, he seemed to be quite um on his own he seemed to be quite oh, I see. I see. you see yeah, what i mean yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so for instance if you're yeah. reading the the biography or the work of another thinker he might not come up because he just didn't seem to to yeah. situate him historically it doesn't seem like oh and and that big philosopher appears at a certain point in his life i got you, I got you. um yeah well that's largely as um i mean i think that's partly him but i think it's mostly uh, a consequence of the time that he was living in because he starts writing really just after the revolution uh when he's basically moved out of uh what was what was it then petrograd i think um to a town where there's more food it's during the russian civil war um, and he's talking about Kant and neo-Kantianism with his friends there. Uh, and then he returns to what's become Leningrad and he, uh, he gets involved in all sorts of groups and circles in the 1920s. But by the time he's really starting to write, uh, it's become the possibilities of debate are becoming more constricted. And by the time he writes his first book, which comes out in 1929, uh, Stalin has more or less taken over the Communist Party, and they have executed this very sharp way, uh, wave of repression, which really makes conversation or discussion with or about any, anyone outside the Soviet Union virtually impossible. And that's the situation he's in for really, I guess, the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, so he doesn't really have the opportunity to engage with other people. I mean, to be fair, even in the early work, he'll mention Bergson, he'll mention Husserl, he'll mention Kant. That's pretty much about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the possibility of a kind of uh, engaged, sustained debate with other people who are writing in the in the twenties and thirties and forties is is impossible because he you know if he you you could not publicly engage with those people without getting yourself really in quite a lot of trouble mm-hmm. to be honest so i mean i think that's the main reason mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay okay you, um, you see, in later life there's various you know they've got all his notes and scribblings and includes bibliographies and you can see like he has heidegger and people there so at some point he thought either he read heidegger or thought I like to read Heidegger, uh, but it you know that's in the like sixties uh, mm-hmm. when things are liberalized. So, so, so what what when's he born and when does he pass away? He's born in eighteen ninety five, mm-hmm. um, and he passes away in nineteen seventy five. 
That's a that's a strange that's a strange life. That's a straight that's a strange span of years to yeah. to 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 live within. I mean, that's a real shift in consciousness, really, in a certain sense. Um, so do you, do you think that this uh, uh, this sort of social context that he's within, which we obviously can't remove him from? There's something in this text you emphasize time and time again that really there's a difficulty with addressing Bakhtin's work in the sense that you you, you state that it's uh, they're they're ruins. His work is really ruins. You know, going through the history, there's bits here and there, but there's no completion. There's no collective whole. And do you think it's this life under these regimes which really led to that, which really led to him having this almost stop and start in a sense? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um... You know, he never has, like, I don't know, I suppose, like, okay, so we'll do the comparison with Donald Davidson. <laughs> I mean, if you read, there's various interviews and biographical this and that to Davidson, you know, and he leads a kind of very, fairly comfortable American academic life. He does his PhD, he goes out to California, he gets a job there, he gets fellowships there, and so forth and so on. It's all, you know, he has jobs and he writes and he does stuff and it's fine. And Bakhtin doesn't really have, uh, he doesn't have a full-time secure job until after the Second World War. Wow. So by the time he's in his 50s. Mm. Uh, before that, he's kind of making money, giving private lectures during the 20s. Then he's forced into exile, where he basically works as a kind of economist accountant for a collective farm. Uh, then he works someplace for a year, but has to run away because the purges are starting. Uh, then he's basically in what's effectively a series of safe houses in, in Moscow, where he's not supposed to be because he doesn't have a resident permit um, and, and so forth and so on. So he really doesn't have any secure footing in which to just sit down and he can't publish his work. It's, it's, mm. it's something published in 29. And then after that, it's really, um, I mean, a, there's an article about collective farm stuff that's published while he's in exile, but it doesn't really count. Uh, he doesn't really publish his own stuff then again until for another 30 years. So yeah, it basically, the, the fact that he just writes stuff and then he tries to get it published and then he fails and then he kind of rewrites it and then he writes some notes for something new and then that comes to nothing. That's really a, a direct consequence of his uh, you know, his lack of a professional life, I guess is the best mm. way. I mean, that's, I guess in a certain sense, I would say that's sort of damaging the idea that uh... When when most people nowadays are probably becoming heads of department or senior lecturers, he's only just he's only just getting his first job within somewhere. I mean that's uh, that's the, yeah that's probably uh, <laughs> quite the blow. But I mean uh, perhaps a, an interesting question here would be that do you think that you know the, the historical context of his life and the you know this sort of uh, turbulent turbulent life that he's having led to any changes or any arising of actual ideas of his own you know did did this life that he had to live bring yeah. about any of his ideas yeah i think in two respects in particular well three i i think his his initial work even from the very beginning he is uh, motivated by a sense that, which was common to the intelligence, European intelligentsia, after the First World War, that European culture is falling to pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, that the First World War has shown what a disaster everything is. Uh, and so, you know, his earliest philosophical work is all about the contemporary crisis and what we need to do about it. And it's so it's philosophy that's very much motivated by this sense that uh, the, the whole of Europe is in a crisis, is in a terrible crisis situation. Um, so in that, that, that part of it really is what gets him started. Uh, then secondly, he, he executes a kind of a, a, a mid-course correction in his career in the 1920s. You know, he starts by writing this, it's kind of, phenomenology, I guess, is the best way to describe it uh, in the 20s. And then he starts writing about philosophy of language and literary theory from the late 1920s onwards. And that's what he's known for. I mean, he's famous as a guy who writes about the novel, about discourse, philosophy of language, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, and he turns to that in the 1920s. Now, there's a huge debate within this, this Bakhtin scholarly community um, about why he makes the turn. Some people think he was forced to, he concludes he can never do philosophy because of what's happening in the Soviet Union at the time. And therefore he thinks this is a safer haven. And that might, there might be some truth to that, but there's also maybe some indication that this, he had friends who were very involved in literary theory and philosophy of language, and he might just have been inspired to do that. Anyhow, he makes this mid-course correction, and that really changes what he does. That really sets him to become the Bakhtin that people are familiar with. And it's all to the good, to be perfectly honest. I, I think he's, you know, a, I suppose he's a modestly interesting philosopher, but he's a very interesting philosopher of language and cultural theorist. So I think whatever made him do that, that was great because um, he had to really get, partly because he then had to engage with language and with literature. You might say he had a, a kind of empirical cultural world to deal with on which he had to test his ideas mm -hmm. uh, in a way that wasn't true with the philosophy. The philosophy, you know, it's pretty abstract. Um, and I think that having to engage with language and literature in that way did him a world of good and actually led to much more interesting theory than he would have produced if he was had just gone on as he as he started in the beginning. And, and finally, I you know the the impact of uh, Stalinism had did have a very dramatic impact on his work. Um, from the 1930s onwards, he writes about philosophy of language as if language and in fact the culture at large is kind of split between these two warring forces, this kind of centralizing, nationalizing force, and then kind of popular culture, carnivals and all, all this whole complex of other things. And that's clearly inspired by what's going on in the Soviet Union directly. Mm -hmm. I think that sense that, you know, it isn't just that language is this thing that everybody does and everybody does it more or less the same, but that in fact, it's, it's inevitably bound up with political and social struggles, I think that all comes from that. And I think that was, I mean, it was a terrible experience for him to put it mildly, but it was, it had positive effects on the world. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That makes complete sense. So really we could say, it seems that there isn't too much there empirically, you know, within the biography that says, oh, this is why he changed, but that general milieu or, you know, uh, political pressure that he found himself in is probably the like, the, the, the likely cause of, okay, my philosophy needs to sort of transform into something which is criticizing or addressing what it is, which is currently stifling everything. Yeah, yeah, I, that's, that's a fair summary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll throw uh, a big question here to sort of open up uh, Bakhtin's philosophy, I guess, considering that we've been We've, we've delved quite deeply now into context. The idea of context for Bakhtin in his own work is extremely important. So I'll begin really with the negative, which is what for Bakhtin would be a discussion of work or of philosophy without or literature, without context, without that social biographical context? What is What would that be that we're, we're dealing with then? Well, the easiest, I think the easiest way to address that is to say that he believes he is addressing or uh, criticizing a concept of language, which thinks of language as contextless, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that it thinks of language, it, it thinks of language in very much the way that Davidson was attacking, <laughs> enough. Uh, and, and, you know, in line, what he says, language in the spirit of socio, that is that there's a formal system, we learn the system or somehow, it, it, somehow it, it's, it's uh, uh, settled in us. Uh, and then we deploy it in utterances, you know, we, you know, we, we know how to manipulate the system and that, that's how we speak. Um, and the significance of what we say deter is determined by its the place of the utterance in um, how the utterances, various parts and composition are determined by the, the general code or system of language. Mm -hmm. So he thinks that's a sort of contextless view of language where the utterance has no context other than the system which allowed you to produce it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yep. So <laughs> is, uh, is, is Bactin a proto-Davidson or is Davidson a, a Bactinian? Mm, well, I think their critiques come from different directions, <laughs> which is what, why they would be interesting companions. Um, because uh, because Bakhtin thinks that the reason that you need to think about language in context is because it actually puts the activity of language in a completely different light. Um, because when language is in context, you might say you're, you're doing something with it. Mm -hmm. it. It's active, it reaches, there's a very vivid phrase from one of his essays where he said, um, discourse lives outside itself in its living uh, directedness towards the object. Directedness is a term he lifts from uh, Husserl. Okay. Um, and what he means is that um, language is always, it, you know, it's not, uh, it's not just a thing where you're kind of denoting objects or talking about the world. It's actually, it has a kind of aspiration, let's put it like mm. that. It's kind of reaching outwards and you only get that when you think of it in, as something in context. I completely yeah, okay. That that that's extremely articulate because because earlier when you said it's a sort of phenomenology, I thought I don't fully understand that, but now I get what you mean ah, in this terms okay. of language as an in, an intentionality. It's yes. and to yeah. remove it from the identification of the person who's saying it, the body that's saying it, the body language, the object, and the you know the 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 communication is to have something completely different. To have the di different phenomena. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Sorry, I was, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm sort of uh, positively stumped in a certain sense because that you know oh, that. Okay. Would you want me to give the Davidson answer to Wally? Yeah, I think yeah, I think the Davidson okay. answer would be okay. would be so, I want to uh, see these two yeah. two angles would be great. Davidson Davidson is less interested in thinking about language as to something which is always you might say overreaching its object that's always um, kind of pushing into the future. He's he's interested in, in context because he thinks um he's interested in how people manage to communicate in situation you know given that he believes the raw data of the language you know the the meanings of the words rarely tell us enough about them to understand what's going on so you might say he all he also i mean it's similar he wants to kind of reconstitute language as a kind of social action uh but he's much more uh, of a empiricist about it. You know, his, his way of talking about it is he says, you basically, you, you develop a theory about what the other person means. And the other person has a theory about what they're trying to mean. And when your theories match, then you have understanding effectively. Okay, uh, so sort of a, re a rebuilding of a structure from this sort of decentralized form of language, which is built up. But from the results, you can go, okay, well, let's try figure out yeah, the structure the okay, is, okay. The, the point of that is theory is that the components of the theory that you have when you're trying to interpret what somebody's saying are very heterogeneous they're but, not just they're not just things like you know what do these words mean i know it from the dictionary or i know the vocabulary i understand syntax they're also things empirical things like what's this person like why are they talking to me now what are we doing here have we spoken in the past you know so okay. he, yeah so it's all sorts of stuff like that too. I mean, that's an interesting little node to take though, because in relation to Davidson, of course, he then has a, from the, the utterances of language, he then has a purpose or something to do with it as to build up a structure we can then use. Mm -hmm. But for Bakhtin, after his, uh, his understanding of language, did he then seek to use that knowledge or was he, did he sort of just, you know, philosophize this idea of language and just seek to just let it, let it do what it's going to do? Was there, a, was there a purpose for him? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, okay. There's two. <laughs> he doesn't just seek to philosophize because his model for, he, he, think, he basically then writes uh, as if there are kinds of language use which exploit this contextual intentional element of language, which seek to foreground it. Uh, which seek to, let's say, represent language as uh, a voice, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's kinds of language use that seek to repress that. Okay. Um, 
And uh, the novel is his word for all the kinds of, I mean, he thinks actual novels do that, but the novel is a kind of big category for the kinds of language use where you try to draw attention to the contextual feature, where you try to turn language into this active, intentional uh, thing um, through a variety of, you might say, sort of metalinguistic or metasemiotic techniques, um, and his language, which doesn't. So uh, he then spends most of his time writing about and giving you examples of in the, from the literary canon of the sorts of language that do one or the other. Uh, and he wants to show, and he wants to show that the kind of writing that he calls novelistic, uh, which is this language that um, exploits these facts about language, uh, has a long history. He goes back into Greek antiquity. He brings it up yeah, more or less to the 19th century. Um, so he, he, you know, he spends most of his time trying to do show how this to cash out this philosophy of language in the analysis of particular literary forms and styles and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. The larger point is he has, um, he has a more general social project. Um, I've described that in the book in terms of his kind of messianism. You know, he because he's kind of believes in a kind of messianic that, that our acts and behavior are motivated by a sort of sense of a messianic future. And his philosophy of language is actually part of that. Well, it is, is the way in which he works through that whole project. So he has a kind of larger notion of social action of which language is a part. He never really, talk, he only talks about that bits and bobs, but it's clearly the philosophy of language is not there just because he's keen on language. Um, or just because he's interested in language as a topic, mm -hmm. but as part of a larger philosophical project. As part of where it can be abused to begin to form sort of certain structures. I mean, not to, to sound a bit too, too cheap to tie it all together, but the certain structures which are at that time are the same same language structures in a way which are oppressing him and countless of countless others. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to just call it uh, um, oppressive because um, in the beginning, when he first comes up with this theory, the people he's polemicizing were aren't Stalinists, they're mm -hmm. actually Russian poets, <laughs> you know, who didn't hurt anybody. So, so. <laughs> what, okay, what, what's, what's, uh, okay, not oppressive. Uh, what's, what's, what is the abuse? What is poetry abusing when it comes to language? Ah, well, okay. So it's he, he thinks that what um he's really not polemicizing with poetry as such. Um he's really polemicizing with theorists of poetry writing in the teens and twenties in Russia and then the Soviet Union, who uh get heavily invested in the idea of a distinct poetic language that's a kind of higher language. Mm -hmm. And uh it has various forms with the symbolists, it's a kind of, they describe it as, as a priestly kind of language. Uh, in, with the Russian formalists and futurists, it's more kind of avant-garde, sort of highly experimental kind of language. Uh, but the idea in both cases is that you can do special things with language as such, uh, which will have kind of quasi-magical effects in the world mm. uh, and he thinks that they basically taken language out of context i suppose that their models of language involve investing language with a you might say with uh, how should i put it almost with the wrong kind of force not the force it gets from being part of a social world and social action and being intentional in the sense that we've talked about it mm. uh, but being invested with a sort of magical halo mm -hmm. um, Did, was was Vakhtin sympathetic to any sort of you know often people cite poetry as that thing which can be uh, a transcendental or transcendent form of language you know one of the few which which seeks to uh, take you beyond was he sympathetic of of any sort of beyond or other place or was he very uh, materialist well I think 
I think you'd mentioned um, uh, I I picked out in the book uh, a quotation where he talks about uh, that the world we have to think of the world uh, or is uh, not in terms of vertical ascension but in terms of the horizontal of mm-hmm. history. So he 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 thinks you know it's so, so far as he has a theological perspective. Uh, it's really that um, we are uh, bent towards the future mm-hmm. and towards a kind of a belief in a sort of messianic possibility, not that it ever arrives, and that therefore the things, the beyond that we're reaching toward is always this messianic future that's kind of just at the edge, just over the horizon of history. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, if there's something, uh, you wouldn't call it transcendent, it's something that that animates the present mm. that is not just part of the empirical world it's that messianic future it it animates the present because it makes people reach or move toward it, it makes them it allows them to behave ethically and responsibly and so forth and so on uh and that's the thing to which they're moving um as opposed to the notion that you know you kind of die and then you go somewhere upstairs um so that he was, he was, he was fairly hostile to that idea of the transcendent. Mm. That there's a different sphere that, in some sense, I mean, coexist. I know is not the right word philosophically, but that, in some sense, is layered above our earthly existence. Mm. So he's he's quite explicitly hostile to that. So, sort of, um, perhaps this is a little bit of a stretch, but as you mentioned, you know, the horizontal of of history, you know, in this vertical, I mean, which is really uh, the theology of the cross. Right, the vertical being uh, man's Jacob's ladder, if you will, or man's spiritual development. Is he sort of saying that poets, in 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 keeping with that idea of that la- of poetic language as having this license to to go beyond, they're sort of being quite ignorant of the fact. It's like, yeah, okay, you can say that, but life's still life's still going on. You're ignoring the horizontal when you do that. He he thinks. Okay, I guess a way to put it was that he thinks the way in which they use language dehistoricizes it, mm. and in that sense, and the interest in language, in terms principally of its figuration rather than its let's say its social concreteness, the meaning it gets from being said by particular people in a particular place at a particular time. He thinks yes, that is um, their way of of transcendentalizing language in a bad way yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the same the same runs true for for myth for Bakhtin correct or is it or is there yeah. a little bit of a difference there no well no I, I think that myth becomes a new it's basically um a, a tool or a concept he picks up from Ernest Kassir uh in either the late 20s or the early 30s it's not exactly clear when um and um he uses myth as a new way to explain this phenomenon uh for him yeah myth is equally a problem myth you know i mean in myth words have a a kind of direct connection to the transcendent you know they embody these magical or animistic forces that run through the world in in an immediate way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that he thinks is a problem it makes me wonder what he would make of sort of, um, you know, the era of literature, especially in America, of sort of postmodern cut-up texts and this complete de- deconstruction of the text. Do you think he would be hostile to this or maybe even supportive? I think he has... Uh, my first instinct is to think that he would cast it into the pit of empty wordplay <laughs> which is <laughs> which, which was sort of an accusation he was making against the russian futurists in their time you know they were famous for like writing poems which were made entirely of syntactic variations of the word of morphological variations of the word laugh and this sort of thing uh and which he was completely unsympathetic to uh and so i'm tempted to think he would you know he I mean, I'm sure he would draw distinctions. There are there are writers who you might call postmodern who do all sorts of interesting things because they 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 use some of the technical features of postmodernism, but they they have serious things that they're about. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I'm sure he'd be sympathetic to that. And then there are writers who, you know, seem to have a new toy. And mm. I think he'd be less sympathetic to that. Okay, so the big thing for Bakhtin is, is really not to use these sort of um, hmm, progressive toys, as you said, for their own sake, just to, to sort of say, look look at what we can do with the language. It still yeah. has to have some yeah. concrete uh, historical purpose. Yes, hmm. yeah. Well, to, to, to sort of move, I guess, in some sense, move away from language, but to bring in uh, one of the other ideas uh, which Bakhtin is, is, is known for, I, the, the I for myself and then the, the other for, for me. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, where do these come in and, and what, I guess, specifically is the I for myself? Um, these are the concepts he places when he very, with the very first writings that we have of his. Um, so there are things that he begins to write about in the late teens and early 1920s. It's because all we have are, you know, kind of moth might be manuscripts. The dating on on most stuff is fairly uncertain, but particularly mm -hmm. when it's early stuff. Anyhow, when he first starts doing his philosophical writing, these are his key terms. His, 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 rough, his claim roughly is that in order for people to act responsibly, to be motivated to act, they have to be conscious of this fundamental split, what he calls this architectonic, you know, that there are not individuals who are more or less who, uh, scattered around. And it's not that I'm an individual and you're an individual and therefore we relate as such, but that for every person, there is an absolute phenomenological divide between what he calls the I for myself and the other for me, by which he means the way in which we experience our own feelings, ideas, utterances is absolutely distinct from the way we experience the feelings, ideas, and utterances of others. Mm. Uh, so the I for myself is about how you experience your own desires, your, as I say, your feelings, uh, your language, mm. as opposed to how you experience the language of other people. You know, for whom, for example, you don't have, you know, obviously don't have the feelings other people have. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you see saw interpretable signs of their feelings. They do things which you lead you to believe they have those feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you can't have their feelings in the way that you can have your own, just to use the simplest example. So, I mean, I guess to, to draw in uh, another aspect of his work, I mean, Bakhtin, as I understand it, had an appreciation of Christianity, whether or not he was a Christian, perhaps you could add that in. Um, is this some form of, you know, being able to, uh, is the purpose of these philosophical ideas, the I for, I for myself and the other for me, eventually to be able to, you know, uh, radically empathize with another? Um. Radically, I'll say radically sympathize, and then I'll say why I'm making a point of that. Um, he believes that a consequence is, is that there's really no such thing as empathy. Because you can't, he says, when you, when you sympathize with another person, there's a line, I can't remember it exactly, but he basically says, if somebody cries for help, if they're suffering, mm. your response to them is not to feel their suffering, but to help them or to say something consoling to them. Mm -hmm. That is, you see them as somebody who is suffering, which is not the same thing as being that suffering person yourself. Mm -hmm. And for him, this distinction is central to all ethical behavior. Okay. Right? Now, he inherited it. It's not something he came up with, really. It comes from Herman Cohen. But um, uh, he picks it up and he kind of runs with it. Um, uh, so his idea is that, yes, uh, the, the fact that we can sympathize with people is a consequence of this split. Mm -hmm. uh, and But it also tells you what it means to sympathize with somebody. For him, sympathizing with somebody is not having their feelings, mm -hmm. but it's precisely seeing them as an other person who may be suffering and therefore being motivated to help them. He has a, a line somewhere where it, in, in his early works where he says, you know, the whole idea of self-love for him is, is contradictory. You can't love yourself. You can only love the other. Why can't you love, love yourself? Because you have to have this, you have to have this distance in order to love someone. 
you, you know, you're, you can't become attached to your own feelings and utterances and suffering in the way that you can become attached to the suffering of somebody else. To him, you can only really love somebody else. Okay. You know, um, and, and, and in that sense, you know, it's not that love of the other is love of yourself projected outwards, but if anything, the other way around. Okay, I think I see what you mean. So, for instance, when someone else, I mean, perhaps to draw in the language th thing here, yeah. when someone, when an other uh, utters something, you as someone else can see that that sentence objectively. You can see the context, you can see who said it, you can see yeah. it far more objectively, and so you can choose to love it, whereas you can't look back inwards on your own utterances, your own being in that way. Uh, yeah, that's sort of it. Um, okay. You know, he, he just, he really thinks you might say inwards, there is no object to love. There's, you know, because you're, when you're as a, as a, he thinks of the eye for myself is basically you're always active, you're aspiring, you're doing, you're wanting, you're pushing forward. And there's never, there's not a thing there that can be the object of love or sympathy, uh, unlike other people uh, who can be. But is 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 that for Bakhtin the fact you can love them? Is that you putting a box around them? If if you're always changing, how come the other isn't always changing? Uh, yeah, it is. It is a little bit putting a box around them. Okay. <laughs> because I mean, he and he makes a point that you know he says basically uh, the other for me, you know, they can die and you can see them die, and their life is finished, and, and you can see often says that you can see the other for me, you can make them something whole and complete in a way that you can never do for yourself. Because, you know, you're always pushing in his mind. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm explicating, not endorsing. Mm. In his mind, uh, you are always pushing forward mm. and in a sort of way that's endless. Uh, so you can never really be, he believes, whole for yourself. You can never really be in integral. Um, for that, it's only others who are integral because you see them from the outside and as you put it, you can put a box around them. I mean, that doesn't, I don't mean to criticize, I, normally I don't criticize philosophers on here, but that doesn't seem like a very good ethics. Because it, isn't that what Stalin, or, or in a certain sense, that they were doing with language is putting a box around people and, and by putting a box, box around oh. someone, eventually you're, you'll be entering into a complete ignorance of any Oh, I see. Okay, I didn't mean putting around the box in that way. <laughs> um, uh, no, no, he meant that you can you can give them a sort of wholeness and to him... I mean, I, this this language is kind of language. You can bless their life as a completed life. Uh, okay, okay. You see what I mean? That's mm -hmm. what you can do. And you can't do that for yourself. Somebody has to do that for you. Mm. What, so wh where does his concept of the eye, I mean, so there is, it really isn't an eye. Is it sort of, where does the, wh do, do we have anything in the history of where his concept of, you know, the ego, the eye, that inner thing, whatever it is, even if it is nothing, did he develop that from from another philosopher? Well, I can say he took the the, the dis distance between I and other. I suspect he he took it um, partly from Herman Cohen, who is a German Jewish philosopher, uh, with whom a very close friend of his, Matvey Kagan, had studied. Uh, a person who had, and Kagan had been in Germany with Cohen and Kassir and various other people, and then they. When Bakhtin first was starting to philosophize, Kagan was one of the people he talked to a lot. Uh, and this was very central to Cohen. Cohen had a whole theory of ethics where basically it was about turning really about your way in which you could love the other or the thou or whatever you want to call it. Um, there probably were other sources. I mean, he'd obviously read a bit of phenomenology. Uh, he read Shaler, mm -hmm. Max Shaler. Yeah. He was who had written the essence of sympathy, um, and uh, so I think there were phenomenological sources as well. Um, there may have been also uh, some Russian religious writing that was important, though I'm kind of less familiar with that. So, mm -hmm. does does I mean I guess especially in relation to the ideas of of sympathy and and complete lack of empathy or inability of empathy uh, is this is this really where Bakhtin's appreciation of Christianity comes in but it doesn't from yeah. from what you wrote in here it doesn't seem to go really beyond an appreciation well there's there's a point in which he makes a direct analogy uh between his ethics and Christ's teaching he says it's absolute severity for yourself mm -hmm. absolute mercifulness towards the other mm -hmm. 
And to him, that I for myself, other for me split, embodies that. Mm. So he does, and there is, there's, you know, and there's, there's a sense, especially in the earlier writing, where he says, um, you know, it, and the the assumption is that we're effectively frail ourselves and incomplete in some radical way, and that we, but there, and there are others who can love us and redeem us basically and and make our lives whole and beautiful in this sort of way in a kind of general way uh and others have to do that and it, there is a point at which he kind of implies that the possibility to do this is grounded in someone for whom we are all other and that's clearly a day you know some mm, divine okay. figure see what i mean mm. so he, he's fairly upfront about the religious analogies let's say was was I mean I guess it's it's difficult under under his circumstances, but he was was he a sort of a practicing religious person under in any in any sense? Um, there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, it would have been very difficult to be a practicing religious person in the times and yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, no matter what your religion. Uh, so no, uh, he seems to have, but it was clearly something, let's say, important to him. Okay. Uh, and you know, there are kind of, I mean, I don't. This uh, a lot of Bakhtin scholarship is uh, gets very tangled up in, you know, is he really a religious philosopher? Or is he not? And there, there are a lot of people who really think he is basically a religious philosopher who ended up having to write about literature because he couldn't write about religion. Mm. And I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think he was more seriously interested in the stuff he actually wrote about than those people would let on. But there's, you know, it, the, you know, the kind of religious overtones are there pretty much through his whole career. So I think it means something to him. It's, it's a big ingredient. Let's say mm. it's an ingredient in the dish. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Did he ever catch any sort of political flack for that? Because was, was it overt, or was he quite uh, subtle and tactical about it? No, no. It, he did catch political. Well, did he catch political flack for? In a sense, when he was arrested uh, in 1928, he was arrested. The charge was that he belonged to a reading group called Resurrection, mm -hmm. whose title probably gives you hint about what they might have been and it was not it wasn't like a right-wing anti-bolshevik group uh <laughs> in fact one of its leading lights was a uh, actually a, quite a bolshevik um sympathizer although he's also very religious that was not uncommon at the time uh so in fact he was arrested and charged with belonging to this anti-soviet organization which was a religious reading group and he was eventually sentenced to six years in exile so so yeah he did receive flack <laughs> well it's a little a little bit more than flack i guess yeah. um so well yeah one thing i wanted to bring in which um is always interesting me in philosophy is that uh, uh, laughter and and i guess the two two pillars in a way laughter and seriousness these are these are very important for Bakhtin's literary critique and do they do they uh sort of season his work throughout this idea of laughter and uh seriousness um, they come in, there's a, there's a hint of it in the early 30s, because he that's when he writes this essay, Discourse in the Novel, which is really the first big discussion of his philosophy of language and his kind of literary, account of literary history. Um, he kind of says, well, I think the novels, the real roots of the novel lie in the kind of popular culture of uh, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in, in, in what he'll later call Carnival. Um, and he doesn't really call it seriousness yet, but there's a kind of implication that that's the, that the, that's a good way to characterize the, the bad guys, to put it crudely. Um, but he really only begins the whole laughter serious thing really only comes into its own about five or six years later in the late. 1930s, he starts becoming very interested in what he calls popular festive culture, and he starts writing about Rabelais. And at that point, he starts talking about what prevents us from grasping the nature of language as what he calls official seriousness, um, which is a sort of another version of myth, I guess. Mm. Um, 
And again, it's it's really, you might say, to, to, to just keep it in the language in which we're discussing things, it's the kind of, the, the claim to directly embody a kind of transcendent force in, mm. the, in the creaturely earthly world. So does he see, in a, uh, perhaps in, a, in quite an overarching sense, does he see laughter as an antidote to to the context that he was within, as something which can sort of cut through that? Yeah, well, well, laughter is supposed to distance you. Is supposed to give you this distance, this sense, and you know, in, in part of the sort of ordinary way. I mean, laughter often starts with something, and then it will give you a sudden flip where it changes the context, and so a certain word or phrase or action means something quite different. Uh, and so he's thinking of laughter as something that provides you with a sort of distanced view of language and cultural features. Uh, and that's the right way to see them. In the same way that if you understand language as contextual, you also understand it as not directly, you might say, not directly incarnating meanings. Uh, in the same way, laughter also provides you with this uh, distance from things. It gives you, he calls that, says it makes you fearless mm. uh, because you um and also because it's always this this dramatic reversal things look one way and then suddenly they look differently and he wants to always keep alive he's a part of the con when you look at language contextually that always makes you aware of the fact that you could actually flip things and a certain utterance could mean something almost completely different than it does and this sense of the possibility of radical transformation and as an ever-present possibility, is is central to his whole ethos and thinking about language and culture. Mm. That's what I was going to say. I mean, in just tying this sort of all together, and in, in, in especially in you know, it really interested me the way you you discussed his his work as uh, ruins. I believe that's what you said in in the yeah. book. Um, yeah. That notion that you've brought about as laughter as distance. It seems maybe Bakhtin himself didn't. In, in, you know, intend to do this. He was, he fell in. You know, he, he was happened to be born in the circumstances he did. But reading you, reading the book, it did come across that his work at all times is very distant, uh, in a very general sense. And you know, I said in my questions here that the way that <laughs> I got the impression at the end of the book that his project, if if it could even be described as a project, was quite impotent. It was quite uh, not lost, but it it um, could it even ever be said to be successful did it have something which could be considered a success or was it uh you know simply a diagnosis well i think it it, it was it was partial in that it's partly him it's not just the circumstances you know his his talent was to take a certain idea and then push it say okay i'm going to say that all discourse in the novel is dialogical, even though very little of it is actual dialogue, well, even though only some of it is actual dialogue. I'm going to say that laughter is actually cent central to all these things that you don't think it's central to, um, and so forth and so on. He was very good at taking a certain idea and kind of pushing it to its extreme philosophical consequences. Uh, so part of that is that he didn't really leave a kind, and also this is probably the circumstance, he didn't really leave kind of nicely worked out theory, which then other people can come and adopt. Mm. You know, it actually there's a lot of rough edges. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of incomplete parts. There's a lot of bits which you have to figure out which don't quite make sense. Clearly, they, they've been successful in the sense that his terms have become ubiquitous. You know, there's you know, dialogism and heteroglossia, yeah, you know, I for myself and the other for me and all this stuff is now kind of, if I can put it this way, you know, common parlance within academia. <laughs> um, uh, so they've been successful in that way, but there aren't Bakhtinians in the same sense that there are Weberians or Durkheimians or Husserlians, uh, because he never really elaborated a coherent, complete theory of what he was about. He kind of put down markers, let's say. You know, or issued promissory notes, mm -hmm. which we have to try to cash. Do you, do you think to even try become a Bactinian or, or develop a Bactinian school would itself be in some way damaging to the to the to that critique of structure which he was on about within language? Well, I I, I don't think there's any harm in trying to make 
the incoherent coherent or you know i don't think there's there's bits where i think you you need to do work that he didn't do and i think that's a good honorable worthy thing to do um i'm i'm you know but i'm part of the problem of spending so much time with him is that you become identified with him and i've never thought of myself as a bactinian <laughs> You know, I'm not a devotee of the guy. Mm -hmm. I think he did some interesting things. Uh, I think he missed a lot of stuff. I think he's a useful contributor to the way that we think about language, but I don't think he's the only interesting contributor. And I wouldn't, you know, although I spent far too long of my <laughs> life <laughs> trying to work out what he was about, uh, it's not because I think kind of, you know, if I could only figure it out, then I'd have the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's worth working on, I think, but you have to have a, a, a somewhat critical distance, if you like, approach to what you do. Mm. And Assume where, there's big holes there. Mm, mm. And where would we find his influence? Did anyone not notable pick up the torch or has it just been sort of well, used as a tool? Well, he became hugely uh, influential in literary studies for quite a while and still is now he's kind of in a bit in the background because these other people are you know sort of trendier um but the whole idea of dialogism and heteroglossia and the context uh, ladenness of language in novels led to you know endless literary analyses where people say look here is you know dialogical writing in this novel or and so forth and so on often in ways which I'm not super happy with, but, you know, it was influential. And in, and in sociolinguistics and linguistics, it, he actually would have been pretty influential as well. I mean, the, his theory about the particular ways in which languages uh, indicate their context and show the signs of their context um, has actually become pretty important in a lot of sociolinguistics. Hmm. Okay, okay. Where would you... Um other than the Cambridge introduction to Mikhail Bakhtin, where would you advise, which which I genuinely would say to people if, if you want a great, very accessible introduction, very readable and accessible introduction to Bakhtin, then this book is great. But where are other, where else would you, you advise people to begin if they were interested in his work? Um, you mean in terms of his reading Bakhtin himself, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. the obvious thing. Uh, well, the big collection is called The Dialogic Imagination. And that has his essays on the novel um, written in the 1930s and early 1940s. And that's, I think that's his best stuff. Um, there's a slight issue because we haven't talked about this and it's fine, but you know, the whole editing and publication of his work was a huge mess, not anybody's fault, it's just the way things played out. Uh, so the text and dialogic imagination are kind of sort of compromised and, they're not really the full text that we have now. But if you want, that's the place to start. Absolutely. And there's a book on Dostoevsky, uh, Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics. That's a, probably a bit more literary than the other ones. Um, but the dialogic imagination, the four essays there, particularly the essay discourse in the novel, which I think is the most important thing he ever wrote. Mm. That, would be, that would be the thing to read. Okay. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add about uh, Bakhtin's work? Of course, there's much more out there but is there anything you um you'd like to add uh no um you know i i hope we've given the impression that he's worth reading uh, <laughs> i think he is he's 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 not the he's not uh he's not a graceful prose stylist mm -hmm. um in fact the english translations in a way make him more readable than he really is in <laughs> russian so they've done everybody a favor um but he's worth it uh, and he's he's very interesting, but no, I think we've we've gone through quite a lot. So. Uh, okay, and your book, I believe, can be found on Amazon, and I imagine on Cambridge University Press uh, website as well. Um, so I mean, I'm I'm sort of intrigued now. You know, you said this is your last book, and you said you spent so much time on him. What what now for you, Ken? Oh, so I'm writing. So I'm doing something basically. I'm writing a book which is kind of like the conversation that you proposed in the beginning, the four people around, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but with a slightly larger table. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am um, I became interested in not just working on Bakhtin, but some other people, Davidson and some other people, that there's, there's 
been critiques of what you could call the code model of language or what people think of as a kind of structuralist model of language um, from all, all, in many different places over the last 50 or 60 years and, what's in, and in many different disciplines mm -hmm. in anthropology and sociolinguistics and writing studies and rhetoric and composition, literary studies in analytic philosophy. Uh, and these critiques don't really know about each other. Okay. So they haven't sat down at the table. And so my next project is actually a book where I'm going to sit them all down at the table and going to, they're mm -hmm. going to have a conversation, albeit well, by well, I, I have to ask, who's, who's at the table? Uh, who's at the table? Uh, so um, sociolinguists are at the table. Uh, Oh, there's a guy who works on a thing called Crossing named Ben Rampton, who's working in London, uh, Michael Silverstein uh, and Asif Aga, who are linguistic anthropologists who've done a lot of, who, who've talked about Bakhtin quite a bit, actually. Um, Davidson is there. Um, uh, a guy, there's a guy, he was a sort of eccentric linguist named Roy Harris who proposed an alternative thing called integrationism is there. Uh, and then all these people who work on, uh, they're, they're in what's called written comp in North America, rhetoric and composition, who teach people writing. And they're very interested in um, the way in which people who don't share a code, often people who are, who are learning English as a second language, uh, manage to communicate. And they have a lot of, it's a lot of people who teach people languages or teach people English as a second language and, and who are very interested in globalized English and are very interested in the fact that people who speak different varieties of English uh, who don't share the same code nevertheless manage to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting they can do that. And that kind of is the kind of thing that Davidson says you ought to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that the code model says you shouldn't be able to do. So... Those people, Suresh Kanagaraja is probably one of the most famous uh, ones. Um, so those, those are some of the names who will be in the book. Okay. And when, when, do, you, uh, when do you expect this to be released? Or should, uh, or should, I, I, okay. should I not ask that question? No, no, you can ask <laughs> it. Um, I have a slightly embarrassing history in that. Um, although this Bakhtin book took a couple of years to do, the book before it took about 20 years. So it's, it's a slight sore point, but... Um, I have to get a contract first, uh, and once I get a contract, I think about three years. Okay. Okay. Wow. Well, I'd love to talk to you about it and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll set a, set a timer on my phone for three years. Okay. Right. <laughs> and we'll see. Um, no, that sounds really interesting. I, I, uh, and, and, and it's, it's interesting that it's, it seems to be extremely contemporary as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. okay okay do you uh do, do you have a site or a website or anything where we can you know read all your work or are you uh you just no okay. i'm a dinosaur i'm a i'm not a luddite i'm not opposed to it i'm mm. just really bad at getting myself to do it i mean i am on academia.edu and yeah i can sympathize yeah research gate and stuff like that but i'm very bad at putting my stuff up so so i don't i'm afraid okay academia.edu that okay. you know that that's probably the i do have a spot there okay so. well uh ken hirschkopf it's been great thank you very much thank you <laughs>